Welcome to Ordinary Things, where ordinary things are explained. Today's ordinary thing... Cereal. But what is cereal? Cereal is a popular breakfast food made from processed grains. It can be consumed with milk, yogurt, or straight from the box if you're lazy and or stoned. Today, cereal boxes crowd the shelves at supermarkets across the globe, and in America, it's estimated to be a $10 billion a year industry, putting it in the same league as American institutions like the NBA and gun stores. But where does cereal come from? While the morning-based consumption of grain can be traced all the way back to the gruel-eating ancient Greeks, breakfast cereal as we know it began in 1863 with a mustache-phobic religious maniac named James Caleb Jackson. The owner and operator of the United States' most popular Puritan health spa slash sanatorium, Jackson invented breakfast cereal as something specifically to serve to his patients. He called it granula, and it was made from dried gram flour dough, broken into rock-hard pieces, and then soaked in milk overnight. Jackson was an early proponent of clean, bland eating, and he enforced his rigid diet on his patients as a cure for the mortal sins of drunkenness. Cereal spread like wildfire through the health spa and religious nutjob communities, which were tightly entwined in those days. But while Jackson had his hands full with a madhouse, someone took his recipe and improved it. Another spa owner named John Harvey Kellogg took Jackson's initial recipe, softened it, changed one letter of its name, and brought it to mass market. Yoink! Yoink! Granola was born, and it was the beginning of a cereal empire that would take breakfast tables by storm. But mixing milk with dried wheat didn't really take off until it connected with the 20th century's true religion. Money. Money. Money, man! <laughs> money! Opportunity. No, money. You see, cereal's omnipresence is less a result of its deliciousness and more a consequence of its convenience and of decades of persistent, aggressive marketing. It helped that cereal companies had their origins in these Jonestown health retreats, as their supposed health benefits was one of their first successful selling points. Kellogg's launched cornflakes with the early nonsense claim that it enriched your blood, but they quickly abandoned that elevator fart on the second floor, and instead rose to the top with one of the greatest, most enduring, most utterly meaningless slogans in all of advertising history. Part of a balanced breakfast. Powerful part of this balanced breakfast. New Cocoa Pops are part of this complete breakfast. The slogan is Machiavellian in its genius, as it's an indirect way of saying that cereal as a meal on its own in no way meets your nutritional needs. But that's not what people hear. They hear the last half of the phrase, not the first, and that's exactly how it's designed. Cereal being a healthy start to your day is a dubious claim at best, and an outright lie at worst. Obviously, Captain Chocolate's sweet-ass sugar balls are going to be worse for you than Granny Mildred's brand-based enjoyment flakes. But even the healthiest cereal is basically nutritionally vacant. Regardless, Kellogg struck gold again with their next promotional innovation, the prize in the box. Their first prize, the Furry Jungle Land Moving Picture Book, was a resounding success. And through this experiment, they cottoned on to the advertising technique that would send cereal into the commercial stratosphere. Initially, their target demographic was mothers who'd recently entered the workforce because of the war, and therefore needed something quick to serve their children in the morning. But the popularity of the furry characters in their picture book allowed them to realize that they could cut out the middle woman and instead advertise directly to children, essentially planting an insistent cereal salesman at the waist of every overworked mother in America. So from the 1950s onwards, every cereal company worth its sugar adopted cartoon mascots as potent weapons of mass consumption. Mascots are incredible tools to make companies more recognizable. They allow them to appear personable and trustworthy. They allow them to say, our brand isn't a faceless machine, it's a cat that plays the saxophone. It's a horse that rides a surfboard. What's in our product? Don't worry about it. Here's a cactus in a Hawaiian shirt. Look at Johnny and Janie Black, watching and wishing they had a snack. Hello, what's this? Hang on to your chairs. Our three friends, the honey bears. It began here, with this stop-motion furry threesome known as the Sugar Crisp Honey Bears. But they were quickly downsized to a single, less creepy, traditionally animated bear, the Sugar Bear, who founded the cereal mascot's long history of theft and violent home invasion. Continuing on the fairy tale theme, Kellogg's would launch what would become the longest-running ad campaign of all time. 
Rice Krispies snap, crackle and pop, a group of singing elves named after the noise your teeth will make if you eat too much of their sugar-packed cereal. Frosted Flakes' Tony the Tiger also emerged in this era, initially looking like an off-brand version of himself before becoming the steroid pump that we're familiar with today. As mascots became an essential part of cereal's allure, companies started to make products that resembled their saturated spokes animals. They added freeze-dried fruit, artificial colouring and, um, marshmallows as key ingredients. This is where brands like Lucky Charms, Trix and the General Mills Monster cereals got their glucose fueled liftoff. Soon, the average breakfast bowl was filled with more garish fluorescent colours than an episode of RuPaul's Drag Race. And even the plainest cereal was having mountains of sugar added to its recipe. And this hasn't really changed. On average, children's cereal contains 40% more sugar than those marketed towards adults. And adults' options aren't exactly sugar-free. The best-selling cereal brand in America for the last two decades is Honey Nut Cheerios, which contains a tooth-eroding 12 grams of sugar per serving. Over where the lovely me is standing, I've arranged the sugar content per 100 grams of the three most popular breakfast cereals in the UK. Admittedly, it doesn't look so threatening. But what if I rearranged it all into lines and offered you a banknote? Don't do drugs. In the 1970s, stricter standards were put in place over what advertisers could claim about their products. So at least that put a stop to all those dubious health claims. Uh-huh. Oh, all right. I'm being told that that's bollocks. One of the ways that cereal companies continue to market their products as healthy is to tell us about what isn't in them. We're told they're naturally low in fat or cholesterol free, which is the same as saying that they contain no hypodermic needles or only trace amounts of donkey shit. It doesn't mean what is in them is healthy. The other way is to market cereal as a diet tool, and no one did this better than Special K. Facing stagnant sales in the 1980s, Special K rebranded their cardboard flavour flakes as an integral part of a diet plan. And it probably worked, because it basically advocated skipping two major meals a day and replacing them with a single bowl of cereal. They premiered the diet with this advert, which has aged like a fine cheese left in a crowded sauna. Have you tried the Special K Pinch? Special K's special starvation-based diet was highly successful, at least in terms of sales, and they continued to promote it for decades with their signature blend of body shaming and pseudoscience. Despite rising awareness that cereal was basically crack for kids, the 80s and 90s actually saw a substantial rise in the popularity and variety of cereal. So much so that they ran out of original animated mascots and had to turn to celebrities and characters from pop culture to fill the void. This 1983 advert for a Star Wars cereal, C-3PO's, features the franchise's most affable and most affordable main characters on an alien planet. Because nothing says flavour like a pair of effeminate robots surrounded by a tribe of tumor monsters. Morning, kids! It's a Pac-Man day with my crispy corn cereal! Pac-Man also got in on the action, along with his gang of radioactive condoms. And here, Mr. T and his family of tea bags adopt a flying crucifixion pose to advertise his name brand cereal. It may have taken a few decades, but cereal is finally losing its ring-like grip on our breakfast bowl movements. Since 2016, cereal sales have suffered a sharp decline, and this is partly because there are more options for breakfast and because people are generally skipping the meal more often. But people are progressively aware that frosted grains aren't good for them, and cereal companies are fighting a losing battle against the reality of their content. Even chocotastic brands like Cocoa Puffs have had to reduce their sugar content by 30%, which really only begs the question how much sugar was in them before, considering it is still ostensibly a crunchy chocolate breakfast milkshake. Then there's cereal sexist defender Special K, which is now attempting a 180 on the image that it sold for decades. Here, Special K is still trading on cereal's fanciful associations with healthy living using the same misleading health claims that companies have been spouting since the 1930s. But don't worry, because this time their vacuum-packed, overpriced birdseed is actually feminist. Oh look, she's an artist. Oh look, she can use both of her arms. Look, they're all laughing. At night, how do they do it? God, they must be so empowered. Special K, powering you. Get it? Powering, empowering. I should point out that I'm not trying to push people away from the cereal aisles, but it is still an industry that has spent over half a decade peddling misinformation and breeding generations of sugar-addled children. And if you've ever spent a long plane journey sat in front of a sugar-addled seven-year-old waiting for his next fix, then you know this is basically a war crime. Take away the aggressive marketing, the sugar, 
the artificial colours, and what you're left with is an expensive, unappetising bowl of overheated grain.